So I'm pleased to present the keynote speech for the FATINS Modelica conference. My name is Michael Wetter and I'm working at Berkeley Lab and the topic of my talk is how the Modelica community can support the transition to decarbonize grid flexible buildings. So I'm going to start with uh, explaining what are the main problems, then discuss what we can do about it, and what are the implications for building energy systems. Afterwards, I'm discussing a few specific Modelica-related initiatives that are ongoing, and uh, end the talk with uh, discussing gaps and opportunities that this community can address to accelerate the transition to a decarbonized built environment. So starting with the problems, uh, the global average surface temperature has been increasing at the unprecedented scale over the last uh, decades. And that's caused by uh, human emission that contribute to uh, climate change. This figure gives a concise summary of three of the main stressors that we are experiencing. First of all, across the world, there are significant areas where we measure more extreme uh, hot temperatures. There are also areas across the world where precipitation increases significantly, which leads then to flooding, mudslides, and other environmental problems. While it's getting wetter, it's also getting drier in other areas of the world, leading to drought and increased fire risks. As a point in case, Lytton in Canada measured close to 50 degrees Celsius last June. The next day, the town burned down. So this combination between drought, very high temperatures, and sometimes also increased wind that become often stronger and more frequent in the past, lead to fire conditions that burn down the whole communities. There's also a hidden toll of heat waves that is often not uh, recognized or discussed. What's shown here is in the states of Washington and Oregon, so they're on the west coast of the US, relatively far north. They experienced in the past uh, uh, heat waves that significantly increased the number of dead. So what can we do about it? So some of the good news is that the amount of greenhouse gas emission on the electrical grid uh, keeps decreasing. So what's shown here is for the case of California, the greenhouse gas emissions over the last uh, 20 years. And in green, shown is the installed renewable capacity. So renewable energy becomes significantly cheaper. It also becomes more installed on the grid. And as a point in case, if you're looking at the Kentucky Coal Museum, this aerial view shows that even the coal museum is installing photovoltaic on the roof. So that should tell you something about the comp cost competitiveness of such technologies. With buildings, we have a unique opportunity to address uh, climate change. So buildings contribute in the US to about 40% of the energy consumption. So buildings consume more energy than industrial applications or than transportation. And a similar spread is also seen, for example, in uh, certain European countries. So there's a big leverage that we can address here with buildings. So these figures give uh, two views on the main problem that we need to address. So on the top, we see the frequency distribution in terms of the hourly demand on the electrical grid over one year. So what we need to address here is we need to cut the top left part so that we can reduce the installed capacity, eliminate the use of uh, peaking power plants, which typically are dirty. So we need to cut the tail as shown with the red curve. And that can be done through demand response and load shifting. And we need to move the curve down in terms of uh, increased efficiency. Another view is shown on the bottom of this slide here with the so-called duck curve, which shows the net load on the end of March on the electrical grid for a, a specific day. And as renewables increase on the grid, the belly of the duck, so in the middle around the 1 p.m., becomes deeper and deeper. And the neck of the duck, so the ramp, becomes deeper and steeper. Again, this ramp causes significant problems for the uh, utility providers because they need to uh, install and operate the peaking power plants, which typically are quite dirty. 
So again, what we need to do is we need to flatten the duck through load shifting, and we need to move the magnitude down through increased efficiency. So what are the implications for building energy systems? There are two somewhat opposing uh, trends that we need to address. So first of all, in terms of temperature, in the past, around uh, 30, 40 years ago, we weren't fossil fuel to heat buildings. So we had oil, gas furnaces, etc. High temperature differences were used to decouple control loops. So control was quite simple to do. There were exergy losses associated with that, but one didn't really care much because we were burning fossil fuel. So now moving to uh, electrification of uh, uh, heating systems, second law efficiency suddenly becomes a very important consideration. And in certain uh, low temperature applications for heating, one Kelvin temperature difference between uh, two different uh, system design affects efficiency by about 4 percentage. So we basically need to reduce the temperature difference that we are having in those uh, heating and also cooling systems, and that couples control loops much closer. In view of the storage capacity, in the past we built this glass ballast, but if you're looking at today's energy systems, we are seeing, for example, large thermal energy storage plants, like shown in the photo here, from the UC Merced chiller plant. There are geothermal ge 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 coupling where we have long-term energy storage in the soil, there are technologies like phase change material embedded in the building fabrics. Batteries start becoming integrated in buildings. Sometimes they are stationary batteries, or they can be uh, electric vehicles that we are exploiting here to do load shifting. So load shifting uh, really need to be addressed through storage, and high temperature differences increase storage capacity, as we all know, but again, they incur exergy loss. So there's an optimum that needs to be addressed here. It turns out that once you consider greenhouse gas emission associated with electricity production, operations kettles can be completely inverted. What's shown here is an example on the UC Merced chiller plant, where we implement a modulative control that optimizes for uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Historically, this plant has been, op been operating in such a way that the uh, chilled water is produced at night, when the chillers operate most efficient because outdoor temperatures were the lowest. But it turns out that the uh, uh, greenhouse gas uh, content on the electricity is highest during those times. So once you take into account how much greenhouse gas is embodied in a kilowatt hour of electricity, the operation schedule can be completely inverted. So the optimum of the operating schedule is just the opposite of what it used to be. So we want to produce chilled water during the day when there's excess PV generated and use the chilled water at night when those panels do not produce any electricity. So buildings really need to transition from being controlled for static efficiency to dynamic control that integrate grid, PV, electrical vehicle, waste heat, as well as storage technologies. So today's buildings, they typically are controlled to meet set points. Implicit in these control sequence are notions about efficiency of the system, but there's no really optimization that takes all these systems into account. Where we need to head toward in the future is to a building to grid integration. A building receives grid from the signals, they may even transmit their status to the grid so that the utilities or energy aggregators can start optimizing across portfolio of grids and uh, operate those buildings in a dynamic way. We also need to get much better on the integration of large-scale storage technology that's often much more cost-effective through combined heating and uh, uh, cooling applications at a district scale, because that's a scale where you can often unleash the investments needed for these technologies, and you can also put financing behind it. So there's new systems that we need to uh, further develop in terms of the technology, market, and business models. We also need to get better in terms of energy hubs. So energy hubs are basically uh, uh, centers of the energy systems where we have an integration among different energy vectors. So you can start trading off electrical uh, systems, power to gas technologies, 
filling integration, and also consider transportation, for example, in terms of the uh, electricity consumption of cars and use of batteries that may be available in uh, automotives to shift loads. Key to this uh, transition is really model predictive control. So it's a technology that makes predictions of the energy systems, uh, optimizes the control trajectories, and typically feeds in set point for the controllers for the next 10 or 15 minutes, and then redo the optimization for the next time horizon. So why do we think we can manage this increased complexity if we even fail today to deliver high performance commercial buildings at the scale needed to address climate change? So looking back about 20 years ago, there was a study that uh, tried to figure out what are the control related problems. It turned out that uh, programming errors was the most frequent uh, source of uh, control related problems. Now, Looking at today's uh, control systems, ASHRAE published uh, Guidance 36, so that's a PDF document that has English language description of how to control a commercial building HVAC system. We implemented ASHRAE Guidance 36 as well as uh, other publications done by ASHRAE in 2006 and compared the number of lines of code that we needed to implement those control sequences. And it turned out that the new sequences required about seven times more code. So they are significantly more complex. If you're looking now forward to 2025 or even beyond that, we want greater responsive predictive control at scale. We also want a control that optimizes across different energy carriers. We want to use those models as part of digital twin to further operate uh, buildings in a more effective way. So the whole complexity of the control systems is increasing. Yet we are kind of trying to hide from all this complexity. So this problem that we uh, cannot deliver controls at the scale needed by the industry is not really properly addressed today. So there are a few key challenges that we need to address. So in terms of technical, we need to figure out how do we do better storage integration, how we do operation of those buildings at lower exergy destruction, so better uh, second law efficiency and through that lower uh, primary energy consumption. We need to figure out how to better schedule the operation of the buildings and how to manage complexity of those systems. The other equally important uh, consideration in terms of the markets, we need to make sure that the market actually sends the right energy rate structure and the incentive so that we have a good signals of how to operate and optimize our systems for. We need business models that unleash the investments needed for those storage technology and for efficient uh, combined district heating and cooling systems. And we need to have scalable solutions. So it doesn't help if just a few PhD students crank out new approaches. We need to have approaches that eventually scale up to the building stock. So let me talk about the few key initiatives around Modelica for design and control of buildings and building energy systems. So in 2012, uh, a large team assembled and started jointly to develop Modelica and FMI related technologies under the International Energy Agency uh, Annex 60 project. So that's a, was a five year project that is now continued under the umbrella of IBIPSA as the IBIPSA project one. And it's continuing until the next summer. So collectively, there were about 350 personnel involved in those projects. And at the start of Annex 60, there were, for example, five institutes who developed their own Modelica libraries. There was a lot of duplication. There was limited scope in this library and they were not interoperable with each other. There were also about five different APIs developed for, in quote, interoperability between simulators. And through these projects, we really got a consensus and tools developed that embrace FMI and have some more standardization across those tools of how we can do co-simulation in the billing industry. So IBIPSA project one has uh, two main uh, threats. So one is uh, addressing uh, district heating and cooling systems. So we are moving from geo-information systems 
to those discrete energy system model set that I use for simulation, optimization, and analysis. And a similar thread is being done on the billing information, modeling to translation of uh, HVAC and billing models, and again, simulation optimization analysis at the billing level scale. So the vision of this project is really to create for this application open source software that builds the basis for the next generation computing tools for the building industry. And just as an example here, in 2013, a joint effort started to avoid this fragmentation in the Modelica library development. So that led to the Annex 6 library, which is now called the Abipsa library. And this library is now used as the core of four other Modelica libraries that through a script copy the Abipsa library, rename the package from Abipsa to their top level package and integrate it directly into those libraries. So an end user only has to download one of those four libraries and they get everything that has been jointly developed through the Abipsa library as a tight integration in that end product that's being distributed through those four libraries. So let me discuss uh, some large effort that build on the foundation of the Abipsa Project 1 collaboration. The first one is the Bob test framework that is uh, developed within Abipsa Project 1 and the other two projects are Spawn of Energy Plus and uh, Open Building Control. So how do you compare the performance of different control approaches? So that's what PopTest addresses. For example, Ashri published a high performance control sequence for commercial building in terms of uh, rule-based controls that are described in English language. There's more and more literature about model predictive control in buildings and in some cases, there are also artificial intelligence uh, methods being used. But we all use our own test case for those controllers, our own buildings, and it's really not possible to compare how much better one approach is versus another one. So we really want to address the question of which control approach would one select to operate the building in a certain climate zone, under certain usage, and so that drive the development of the most promising approaches in those uh, technologies. Such a comparison can then also drive, for example, utility incentives, or in the future, one could even envision to have something like an energy label for controls. So if you buy a window today, you can have this energy pass to actually see how well is that window system operating in a certain part of uh, Europe in this case. So given the climate zone, you can select the most efficient window and make an informed decision. Wouldn't it be nice to have something similar for control approaches? So, so far in bot test, we uh, provide an environment that hosts uh, online a repository of virtual test cases. So those are Modelica models that are encapsulated as a functional mockup unit and have some additional information of what control signals can be overridden from the outside and what measurements are available. A control uh, provider can then come in and through a web API uh, interact with this emulator to test the control strategy and get a report of how well the controller performs across the key uh, performance uh, indices. So in the future, what would be nice is if we can build up now uh, uh, database of those uh, control performance and eventually address the situation where a customer or a utility can look at different control offerings and understand how good are they compared to other approaches so that we can buy the most efficient product, provide incentives for the uh, most promising solution, and also redirect uh, future research and development efforts to the most promising technologies. So shifting now more to the modeling and simulation uh, area, we are seeing uh, new design and operation challenges. So there are, for example, new system designs for heating and cooling of a building. There's also new systems for combined district heating and cooling application that uh, use a so-called reservoir networks or sometimes called fifth generation district heating and cooling system that start sharing waste heat and waste sources among buildings and even among areas of a city. We also want to digitize the control delivery process and provide a formal 
end-to-end -end verification of the process with a digital twin. And we want to accelerate building to grid integration so we can actually operate the building based on signals from the grid and based on uh, uh, the voltage fluctuations that we see, for example, in the distribution line as we uh, produce a huge amount of renewables. So to this extent, uh, at Berkeley Lab, we developed the Buildings Library, which is a large library that addresses uh, HVAC systems for buildings, for the strict energy system. We have models for room, heat and airflow, and also for electrical systems. Scalability of those applications to large buildings has always been a problem. So what we are uh, working on right now is a project called Spawn of Energy Plus that combines the best feature of the Energy Plus building simulation software and of Modelica. So Energy Plus is the flagship uh, energy simulation program for buildings that has been developed by the UAE. Energy Plus has simplified assumptions built in uh, pretty deep in the uh, uh, so-called simulation manager. And those assumptions uh, determine how HVA systems are being assumed to operate within that simulator. So it's a load-based uh, simulation that is uh, very strong in building and envelope simulation and in standard HVAC systems, but it has limitations uh, for integration of uh, control models and for integration of those models into a digitized uh, future control delivery process. On the other hand, Modelica is very strong on HVAC system simulation and also on control modeling. It's a declarative language, as we all know, so it provides opportunities to actually manipulate those models for other use than just simulation. But uh, Modelica doesn't offer that many advantages when it comes to building envelope simulation. So what we are doing with Spawn of Energy Plus is we are pulling out the best features of Energy Plus for the envelope and load simulation, encapsulate them behind the scene as a functional mockup unit that's generated on the fly as we uh, instantiate the model, link it up automatically to Modelica models, and then provide a simulation of those integrated system. So with Spawn of Energy Plus, we are also distributing the Optimica compiler, so that's work that's in development right now, but you can use any Modelica compliant uh, modeling and simulation environment for this workflow. For the end user, Spawn of Energy Plus has the same Modelica look and feel, like shown here, where we have a very simple control on the bottom, a very simple HVAC system, and then a Modelica icon that behind the scene interacts with a room model of Energy Plus. But you can have as many room or as many building as is required for your application. So having developed now Spawn of Energy Plus, we still have the problem, how do we make best control sequences widely available to industry and address this uh, underlying issue that programming error are the most frequent problems in commercial building control systems. To address this, we are digitizing the control delivery process. So we prototyped an uh, end-to-end workflow within the Open Building Control Project, where we enable then a sequence uh, selection and performance assessment. So people, designers can select a control sequence, test their operation as part of a Modelica or Spawn of Energy Plus model then export the specification and verification tests in a control vendor independent format. Control providers can do a machine-to-machine -machine translation into their native control product line, and the commissioning agent will get the digital twin from the designer that allows them to do a formal verification of whether the installed control sequence meet the requirements specified in design. To enable such a digitization, we are developing now a new ASHRAE standard, standard 231P, that uh, addresses a key gap in the building control area. So ASHRAE developed, for example, data communication standard or the BACnet standard 135. There's a standard in development for semantic modeling, standard 223P, and there's this uh, English language description of control sequences in guidance 36. What's really missing is a language to express the control logic that's machine readable and independent of a specific control platform. That's what we are developing in standard 231P. 
And this standard uh, that we are developing is called a control description language, and it's a subset of Modelica that we are developing, which essentially is sufficient to do block diagram modeling. And then there are other representation in terms of JSON that are also being developed as part of this uh, upcoming standard. So what we de uh, demonstrated so far is a prototype translation of this control description language uh, from a Modelica simulation environment via JSON to a commercial control product offering. In our case, it was automated logic control as a web control. So it's a machine-to-machine uh, -machine translation where we export Modelica in a JSON intermediate format and then through code generation uh, transform that into the language and the control blocks that are supported by automated logic. So you see here a one-to-one -one correspondence between, for example, a PI controller on the top level side, then a controller that's uh, hierarchical for active airflow set point calculations, and then controllers for damper uh, and valve uh, operation. So you may ask yourself, why don't we just generate C code? So a key requirements from the control industry in buildings is that they need to be able to reuse their existing control product line possibly with minor modification, but not with a control, complete redesign of the control product line. So that's why in ASHRAE standard 231P, we have been using a subset of Modelica that's uh, very simple to use and is sufficient to do block diagram modeling. We translate it into a JSON intermediate format because JSON is much easier to process than Modelica models. And from there, uh, control providers can then develop their translator to their uh, proprietary product lines. At the same time, we enable, because we do use a subset of Modelica, the tool chain that would allow the next generation of the whole product lines to embrace and use, for example, FMI or EFMI standards and go directly via code generation to implementation. So let me talk about what are the gaps and opportunities to improve Modelica for the billing industry. First of all, uh, what we are focusing today are the really the early adopters. So it's the researcher, the academics, product developers of HVAC equipment and control companies who have significant experience in most cases and resources to do uh, uh, model development and simulation. But to really address the needs from the industry, we need to target the next group, which are the mechanical engineers. They are typically young engineers with limited experience. They need to get a simulation job done in a few hours or maximum a couple of days for a large project. They generally don't have a formal background in mathematics and in system simulation, and they expect pre-configured template HVAC systems and controls to just work. So they cannot really troubleshoot the numerical problems that they uh, may occur during simulation, and they need to have pre-configuration of those systems. So what are really the underlying problems here? So first of all, I want to stress here that buildings are large. B buildings typically have hundreds of thousands of rooms. Each may have a thermostat and damper. There may be tens of distribution groups and similar district heating and cooling systems. They typically serve 10 to sometimes even thousands of buildings. Today, we are not really addressing uh, simulation models at that scale because the technology does not scale up to those very large applications. So there are a few key problems for those large systems, and they are really how do we compose models, how do we parameterize them, how we do a simulation, and then a key aspect is also how do we do commissioning or quality control of the simulation, and how do we post-process the simulation results. So let me explain a few needs on all of those uh, areas. So first of all, so a very simple extension of Modelica, I believe it could make it much simpler to uh, support uh, creation of template models. So, so far Modelica supports a redeclaration of a models, but what we really need here is redeclare a model based on a Boolean condition that is parameter variability. So this one would allow us then to have a parameter or maybe an enumeration of the possible model choices 
and based on that, uh, enable and uh, disable parameters and input connectors, which we can already do today, but then also pick the model that uh, is being used or specified by that particular setting. So buildings are unique. Every building has a little bit of a different energy system. However, if you're looking at these energy systems, they all define a directed graph. That could be exploited to run building analytics on top of those models. So that's exactly what energy systems are increasingly doing. So shown here is a graph or semantic model of a building energy system using the brick ontology. And it declares, for example, that there's an air handle unit in a building that feeds two different uh, VAV systems. And these VAV systems have zones that feed certain rooms. And these VAV boxes also have control points and you can query which control points are available in this system. So for real buildings, analytic becomes portable because of those semantic models. So what's shown on the top left here is such a semantic model here indicated with uh, uh, boxes here that represent the uh, models from brick. This brick model then, or semantic model, links to a billing database that has a time series of the data. And on the bottom, we have uh, portable analytics. So you can write uh, analytics, for example, that queries which air damper is being stuck or which zone does not meet the set point. Or you can ask, for example, what's the baseline energy consumption of that building? So all this analytics is written independent of a specific building, but rather based on semantic queries that are then run on a semantic model that links up to the time series of a specific building. So through that mechanism, the whole analytics becomes portable across different buildings. So something similar could be done for Modelica. We prototype the semantic model export from Modelica to Brick. So shown here is a snippet here where we have a heating coil, a cooling coil, and a supply fan. And we can now export a Brick model for that system. And what we want to do in the future is running queries, for example, for all the cooling coils. Is the fan operating when the water flow rate is bigger than one percentage of design flow rate? So that could be used to test, for example, whether the controls is implemented correctly. Similar, we could ask or want to ask whether for all rooms that are too cold, is in the air handle unit the position of the heating valve really at least 90% and is the supply water temperature within one Kelvin of the design value. And maybe we want to average those uh, time series over the last 10 minutes. So by a being able to write such expressions, we could quickly ensure that the quality of our model is really meeting what we uh, wanted to uh, implement in the first place. Another feature that would significantly facilitate the post-processing of models are to apply operators to a selection of variables within certain properties. So consider a fan. A fan in our library is a flow machine that has a medium associated to it. And we could envision, for example, if Modelica supports such annotations to also say that a certain variables is power or more specifically it's electrical power. So if you are using this fan now in an HVAC system, we assign a medium, typically air. And what we want to accomplish then at the end is to sum up all the electrical consumption of all fans in that HVAC system. So it would be nice if you can write queries, for example, select all the instances from an HVAC system where the type is electrical power and the class that contains this type is part of the package flow machine and it has an instance of medium air. So we know it's a fan as opposed to a pump. And then we can sum up all the electrical consumption of every fan in the system. So Modelica is very strong in supporting multiple engineering domains, multiple mathematical domains, various applications in terms of hardware in the loop, simulation and design, but it doesn't scale up yet to very large system models. So we really need to get Modelia to the point where it becomes competitive with domain-specific simulators. One area for improvement is translation of large models. So if often as part of model development, we do small, very local changes in a model. They can be structural, but they only affect a very small part of the model. So it would be great to have uh, uh, tools that uh, 
recognize these uh, localized changes and only translate the model that has been changed. And as an example here, a building with 50 thermal zones that are served by 10 HVAC system takes about four minutes to translate. So that becomes very cumbersome then to do an interactive editing of the models and debugging it or changing, for example, parts of the controls in order to improve the model. So we really want to have a more interactive uh, development of those models. Another area for improvement is the simulation time. So today's simulation time is, uh, today's solvers that are in tools scale super linear in the number of states. So Modelica is uh, implementations are using typically one time step for the whole system. But in our application, we have uh, largely varying timescales from controllers to heat conduction in building envelopes or even in geothermal applications. And uh, as part of Spawn of Energy Plus, for example, we replace the building model with a discrete time implementation of the building envelope model. That already reduces computing time significantly, but not yet to the scale where we need it uh, for the industry. Another area is the robustness of numerical solvers. So our users just don't know how to select among Rada, OC, Dassel, Euler, Runge, Kuta solver, etc. So can't we auto-select the solver maybe based on a test day simulation or based on ongoing solver statistics so to pick the solver that's best suited for the problem? And I think that's really key if you want to realize the vision that Dirk Zimmer presented earlier, where we move from tool integration eventually to autonomous modeling, where the modeling and the simulation should just work out of the box. So to support that, I want to announce here that uh, we are developing a repository of uh, challenge problems from the billing application, and that should be upcoming and is meant to help tool developers making progress on the robustness of numerical solvers. We also like to see improvements in terms of optimization for design and operation. So there has been language extension implemented in certain tools, for example, to formulate optimal control problems. It would be great if you have more uniform support of such features among the tools. And then eventually also move to the areas where we can provide typical users, so not just a PhD student, but typical users with an MPC that's embedded in a design model. Because modulative control can and will fundamentally change how we operate buildings. So we need to find a way of how can we make this technology seamless available in a Modelica toolchain. So I want to leave this talk with a question of how do we best organize ourselves to accelerate the transition of the built environment in view of these pressing and urgent challenges posed by climate change. So thank you very much for your attention.